Okay. What I want to talk about is uh, socialist SEM movements, and um, I really want to put some challenges. It's a bit of a revisionist talk. I want to suggest that we need to think about two terms in particular that we use a lot. One is class struggle, the other is movement. And I want to suggest we, we, we sometimes need to think about them again. The background to it, of course, is that over the last few years there been, there's been a huge surge of <coughs> movements, which we've all noticed with excitement, you know, from Greece 2008 onwards, right through to, to, to today, in Tunisia and Egypt, in Spain and Portugal, in America, first the Wisconsin movement and then the Occupy movement all across the United States. There were general strikes in Nigeria and India, I think, last year. Um, a huge student movement in Chile and another very effective student movement in Quebec. Um, and then this last year, big movement in Turkey around Gezi Park, which spread to whole numbers of cities and big movements in Brazil in the summer. So, you know, we live in the age, not unfortunately in Manchester yet, but we do live in the age of mass movements. Um, sometimes, none of them has broken through, though some of them have achieved quite remarkable successes. The Quebec student movement succeeded in overthrowing the government of Quebec, which was quite something. Um, anyway, the, I want to start with the question of class struggle, because the Marxist standpoint is set out in a letter by Marx in, I think, 1852 to one of his mates, I think called Vedermeyer, but I, I need to check that. The, my sources, um, in which he says, I didn't invent the term class struggle. He says, the bourgeois historians of the French Revolution came up with this idea. What's distinctive about, about my ideas is that I suggest that the class struggle is the means by which societies are changed from one form to another, and that the class struggle under capitalism will lead to the dictation of the proletariat and the overthrow of class society itself. That, he says, is what's distinctive about my theory of class struggle. So he's got an account of class struggle, which is about revolutionary change. Okay, So it's a very all-encompassing idea, class struggle in Marx. Now, we use the term a lot, Marxists, but sometimes I think we misuse it. Um, and I want to suggest a couple of ways in which we misuse it. One way is to say, oh, there's a very low level of class struggle today. And what we're saying is that our side is not conducting very much organised class struggle. That doesn't mean there's no class struggle. What it means is the ruling class, which is conducting a ferocious class struggle, is winning. Okay. In other words, the class struggle is, if you think about it, it's too, the very term class struggle, struggle between classes, both classes are active in the class struggle, or however many classes there are. Um, whatever you think about neoliberalism, it's clearly been a class assault internationally on the, on the conditions and, and so on of workers and indeed of the remaining peasants in the world. Trying to rebalance the whole process of production and distribution in favour of capital. And one of the things that neoliberalism has achieved is a huge distribution of income and wealth away from the poor to the rich. The massive growth in inequality which was set you know, in a sense, remarked on by the Occupy people in 2011 when they said, we are the 99% and most of us are suffering. The 1% is doing extremely well. Um, and that's been in, in Britain, in America, just about everywhere in the world. The indexes of inequality have widened. So that's the first thing. The second thing about class struggle is very often we take it to mean trade unionism, mean industrial struggle. Um, and we treat these, if you like, workplace struggles as central to the socialist vision. But actually, if you think about it, the class struggle is much wider than that. I'll give you a few examples. A couple of I think I mentioned it before. About two or three weeks ago, we had three struggles going on in Manchester that were in the streets, as it were. One of them was the lawyers, solicitors and barristers, some of them wearing their wigs and so on, demonstrating outside the High Court against cuts in legal aid. Now, that's part of the class struggle. The question of legal aid is part of the class struggle, it seems to me. Second was the struggle against the bedroom tax. There was a demonstration outside the court in support of somebody who was coming up in court. And the third was Barton Moss, the, the anti-fracking thing, which is, of course, a demonstration against the rights of capital uh, to use the land 
uh, destroy the land, uh, poison the land and the water and so on and so on. All of those things, it's another aspect of the class struggle. It's not, none of them involve workers going on strike. So the term class struggle, it seems to me, is much broader. So I've come to my re revisionist <coughs> argument, which is about classes. I want to suggest that, and this is, a, here I, get, I tread on very thin ice, I'm aware some people will want to go, uh, 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 at this point. Um, but classes are not political actors. Um, and classes don't make revolutions. And you think, hang on a minute, where's it going with this? The way that it seems to me you have to think about the t a term like class struggle is there's a huge generalisation about the nature of society and about the forces at work in society and in antagonism in society. What, it does, what the term class struggle does is identify the core issues in conflict in a whole epoch of human history. But the classes that you can identify um, when you talk about class struggle do not unite necessarily into homogeneous blocks of people who all think the same. I mean, there, there are people who suggested that's what Marxists think. There was a sociologist called David Lockwood some years ago who wrote a book in which he said Marxists believe in what he called the proletarian endpoint, that there's going to come a moment when all workers will agree and they will overthrow capitalism because they've all come to agree. And then you look at the, the actual history of revolutions, even the, the Russian Revolution, any sort of revolution, never, never as simple as that. Every time, when we talk about a worker's state, what we mean is a kind of picket line thrown across society, the whole of society. But a worker's state is not only directed against um, the employers, any more than a picket line is only directed against employers, it's also directed against scabs, against those who don't agree with the majority decision and so on. Now, a worker's state, in a sense, is a picket line on a very large scale right across society. But it's, it's I mean, if you read the history of the Russian Revolution, it always leaves one group of workers out, those who didn't agree, those who sat at home, those who weren't interested, um, those who, you know, found out, tried to work around the fact there was a revolution going on and so on, those who were very selfish. You can, you can, you can go on and on and, and so on. Lenin has a lovely discussion when he, at the time of the Easter Uprising in 1916, he says... Um, you know, he says, we need to make sense of this. Here's, here's a, a revolution going on in Europe in 1916. The Irish trying to break away from England. This is a revolution. And, there, and we have to be quite clear it is a revolution. And then he says, there are some people who say, think that a, a revolution consists of society dividing neatly down the middle. And some people on one side saying, we are in favour of imperialism. And the other side, everybody stands on the other side and says, we're against imperialism. And, and he said, you know, it's a nice straightforward division. He says, anybody who thinks that such a thing, a revolution will be like that, will never see one. You know, they, you'll wait forever. It will never be like that. Never so simple. And another example, uh, Trotsky, when he's in his wonderful book, The History of the Russian Revolution, which if you haven't read sometime, just get yourself a copy. It's in paperback and you can usually get secondhand ones. And it... It is very long, but it is like one of the greatest novels that was ever written. It's just a fantastic book. And he discusses at one point why it was that the Bolsheviks adopted the slogan, all power to the Soviets. Why didn't they say, all power to the Bolsheviks? Which was what Lenin had suggested initially. And he says, the reason is because the working class was divided. There was one section of workers, quite big, who said, we're for the Bolsheviks, more or less whatever they do. And there's no problem with them. But then there's a second section which said, we're for the Bolsheviks as long as they work through the Soviets. So that's a kind of conditional support. And then there's a third group which said, we're for the Soviets, even if the Bolsheviks are involved. OK, <laughs> in other words, we're in favour of revolution, but we don't, we don't like the Bolsheviks, we don't trust the Bolsheviks. We, we, we support other parties, uh, you know, the sort of person you, you meet who says, you know, I'm in favour of socialism, but I hate the SWP. You, those sorts of, we've all met those people, or soon we'll be meeting people who say that about us in the RS21, no doubt, or whatever we get to call ourselves. Um, the only thing that could unify those three groups was the slogan, all power to the Soviets. 
that anything else would divide them. So you, need, you know, and it was because of the di political divisions within the working class. In other words, the working class, even at the high point of the Russian Revolution, was uh, not unified in its uh, politics. So what does make revolutions? In other words, the, the work, you can't say simply the Russian working class made the Russian Revolution. In any case, there were lots of peasants and, and other non-workers who, 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 whose participation was vital. I think you have to say revolutions get made by coalitions. Or we might call them united fronts. Or we might indeed call them movements. A revolutionary movement is more than a party. And it's, it's less than a class. It's a Sometimes it's more than a class because it involves people from other classes as well. <clears throat> now, the struggle against capitalism and it's the priorities of capitalism takes all sorts of different forms. I mean, if you think about something like the, the, the demonstrations in Gezi Park in Turkey last summer, they began with a group of people that we, we sometimes derisively call tree huggers, who said, you're not going to cut down those trees in the park um, we're going to defend the trees and defend it, defend this public space against the developers. Because what the what the government wanted to do was clear the park and build a shopping mall. Um, in in Gezi Park. Now, is this anything to do with the struggle against capitalism? Well, obviously, who's the antagonist? It's business that wants to build with the government, a huge shopping mall in, on what was previously, you know, every day, everybody's property, a park. And that's, the class struggle encompasses issues which are not directly about industrial questions. I've already mentioned some of these. I mean, you can mention others. The question, whole question of abortion rights, for example, is not reducible to an industrial struggle um, of wages and conditions. Uh, you can talk go on and on and on, fracking and climate change, all those things are not directly uh, industrial questions, if you like. And same with anti-fascist struggles, anti-racist struggles, and, and so on and so on and so on. The fact is that the class struggle is conducted on many fronts, and it's quite interesting to read Lenin in this light, because Lenin talked about, asked the question in the famous pamphlet, What is to be done? In a sense, he asked the question, what's a communist? And he said, a communist is not simply a trade unionist, a militant trade unionist. He said, rather, the phrase he used was, a communist, or what they called a social democrat in those days, but a, a co class conscious worker, a, a party worker, is a tribune of the oppressed. He's somebody who supports all struggles against oppression, regardless of their immediate connection with the struggle against capitalism, um, opposes all forms of discrimination. In other words, the socialist vision is not simply about, although it obviously is importantly about establishing workers' control of production, it actually is about much more. And so if you look back at the Russian Revolution, its achievements included all sorts of things for which it's rightly celebrated, like the, Russia was the first country to legalise abortion, it was the first country in the world to legalise homosexuality, etc, etc, etc. So, the Chalton branch of the SWP had a meeting, I noticed, uh, in the early winter, which asked the question, where does the power lie? Does it lie in the streets or in the workplaces? And the implication is also, where does the struggle lie in the streets or in the workplaces? And I have a feeling I can guess what their answer to the question was, but I think we have to say it's both. It's not one or the other. The interesting question is, to, to what extent can, if you like, the struggles of the street, Gezi Park, the fracking, whatever it might be, can be connected with industrial struggles? And that's a quite difficult question, I think, to which there's no obvious answers. Um, but there are examples. I met Eva and I went to Spain in October, and we met a comrade who used to live in Newcastle, um, who was a teacher there, who was in the Spanish group. And I was asking him about what happened in, 19, in 2011, at the time of the Indignados movement. And he said it was absolutely fascinating that something like 20% of his staff room, at some point, went down to the main square in Madrid and participated <coughs> in the occupations, you know, of the square, the demonstrations and so on, the meetings. 
And he says, it's made a fantastic difference. I said, yours must be a very interesting staff room. And he laughed and he said, yes, it is. Um, and one of the, he said, one of the impacts is that inside the union meetings now, people use twinkling um, <laughs> as a method of conducting, you know, as a good means of conducting. In other words, the, ex the, the excitement of the indignados came into the trade. It, into his staff room and uh, into union meetings and so on. So, right, okay, move on. The question is, with which I want to end, is what do we mean by the term movement? I've said there's a problem about the term class role. What do we mean by the term movement? Now, if you look at the, there's two sorts of places you might look for an answer. One is in the literature on, uh, there's a kind of big academic literature on social movement. And one, or, one American author wrote that uh, the answer to the question is that it's a theoretical nightmare trying to define what a social movement is. And then you think, oh, well, we'll look to the Marxists. And you say, Marx and Engels, I've given you these quotes, um, um, and so on, have all come up with... Uh, they've used the term movement. Lenin uses the term movement. Trotsky uses the term movement. We all use the term movement. But nobody ever, give, ever defines it. So I'm going to attempt a definition um, in five easy, five moves. Sorry, I'm going on a bit long, but I hope that's all right. I'll, sh I'll stop shortly after this. The first thing about a movement is that it is a collective achievement. Now, you might think, well, that's obvious. But actually, not all the forms of the class struggle are collective. I don't know if any of you has ever thrown a sickie. Uh, that's to say, phoned up work and said... Oh, I can't come to work today, you know, I've got this terrible headache, stomach, migraine, whatever it might be, um, I can't come to work, that is not a social movement, okay, that is not a movement, that's you on your own, conducting the class struggle, because you just can't take it anymore. Slaves ran away from the South without confronting slavery individually. Sometimes they did it in groups, but nonetheless, mostly it was indiv an individual thing. You can go on and on. Workers throw spanners into the works at work uh, out of desperation sometimes and sabotage of various kinds on an individual basis. But a, a movement involves collective activity, collective organisation. It means people talking to each other. It means people, some form of organisation, some sort of collective project. It may be on a small scale, like a campaign or the, the camp at Bath and Moss or whatever it might be, it may be quite small, it may be a small demonstration, it may be absolutely enormous, like the Stop the War movement of 20, 2003, you know, to, up to two million people on the streets of London. It, it varies in, in scale and size, but always it's collective. That's the first thing. The second thing, which makes it very peculiar, is that it has a form of organisation. But the form of organisation is not one we're used to thinking about when we think about organisations. <coughs> when we think about organisations, we think about bodies like parties, or maybe unions, or maybe churches, or whatever. We know what to, you know how you join them. Basically, you fill in a in one way or another. You you sign up. You fill in a card. Um, if you join the Methodist, certainly I think you you fill in a card. You certainly fill in a card to join a party or or you fill in a form to join RS21 and so on, or you fill in a card for the union. But a movement, you can join without filling in anything. Um, and its characteristic organisational shape is the shape of, I can't think of a better word, the network. And that's a very peculiar form of organisation, very important form of organisation, but it is... <coughs> It's how people are organised. It's a very variable form. I mean, the, the image I've, I've, I've got in my head, which I can't get rid of, is lace. My mum used to have uh, a lace tablecloth, of which she was very proud. There were lots of little holes in it, and also there were little patterns in it. Um, in the middle, there was a big square that had very little, and then all around the edge, there was lots and lots of little patterns. But you think of the variation in patterns you could have in lace, lace work, well, that's the variation in the patterns of movements. They can, some of them can be highly centralised. I mean, you think of the Solidarity Movement in Poland. It, had, it was a movement, but nonetheless it had a, a, an established leadership at the centre and so on. But on the other hand, other kinds of movements are very, very disparate. They're made up of all sorts of different groups and, and uh, individuals who come together 
for a common purpose of some sort, which brings them together, but you can join without asking anybody's permission. You can come in in one way, you can come in another, you can come in through a church group, you can come in because you're a Trotskyist, you can come in because you're an anarchist, you can come in because you find it morally outrageous that something is happening, or whatever. You can join a movement on all sorts of bases. You can join with your friends or you can join as an individual. Um, and the pattern which is established of the lace work, as it were, is really determined by the, the pattern of relationship between the activists who make it up, the people who, who bring the groups together, in a sense. Um, and, and those patterns can be very, very different in different organisations. Now, that, that, that's the second thing. The third thing, which must never be forgotten when we talk about movements, is that movements are fields of argument. They're not organisations in which everybody agrees. They are fields of dispute, <laughs> disputation, fields of discussion. Not necessarily acrimonious debate, but they are not made up of people who all agree with each other, necessarily. <clears throat> They're constantly... There's what's, a, what's at issue inside a movement is a whole series of questions about what the purpose of the movement is, what its meaning is, what sort of organisation it should have, what sort of activity it should engage in, um, how it should respond to particular crises, and so on. It's not consensual. I mean, people who say that movements should be governed by consensus are dreaming, because movements are never governed by consensus. They're governed by debate and argument. Um, <clears throat> so they're not just agencies for mobilising people into activity. They're also fields of critical social thought and critical social practice, they're very creative sometimes and very inventive. Um, they bring new ideas into birth. It's rarely that parties bring... Movements are much more creative historically than uh, parties. There's one so a pair of sociologists who said that what movements engage in is what they called... Sorry about this phrase, it was theirs. Cognitive praxis thinking, in other words, about what to do. <coughs> and um, and they are the source of major new impulses in society. You think of, I remember, because I'm old enough, the civil rights movement in America was, was happening when I was young. I think the first political book I ever bought was, was I bought in the local news agent uh, about the civil rights movement. I was uh, so excited about it. And it it challenged not just the rights, it wasn't simply about the rights of black people in America, it challenged all sorts of things. I remember the, a slogan that came out in the 1960s, out of the black movement, which was shocking. It was very simple, three words, black is beautiful. And I remember the impact on myself, and must have been thousands and thousands of other people, that when I heard that, Wow, that is fantastic. That's a revolutionary slogan, if ever you heard one. Right? I mean, it led to students all over Britain and all over the world putting up posters on their wall of an image of Angela Davis. Right? Black is beautiful was almost embodied in, in the physical presence of Angela Davis. Um, but it was, it was a revolutionary idea. It didn't come out of a party. It was a, probably, a, I don't know who, it, who came up with it, a poet or a, a comedian or somebody on a demonstration, but it just spread like wildfire as an idea. And it was, it, had, it did more, it added something to the, the cup to our culture, in a sense. It re-evaluated the whole of our cultural understanding of the world in very important ways. So, anyway, <clears throat> you think also of the impact of the women's movement on the way that we think about the relations between men and women and so on. I mean, having, gone, having been there when it started happening, Judy and Eva will remember, um, it was phenomenal in its impact. On society. I mean, it's quite difficult to remember, but it's only the old... I remember at one point there was only me and Paul Foote in the SWP who thought that the women's liberation movement would have been a good thing, um, because it had just revolutionised everything in terms of our understanding of, of, of so much. Now, the, I, th I want to suggest with a sort of half a joke that uh, the two questions which movements face are basically formulated by two famous writers. One of them is Marvin Gaye and the other is Lenin. Marvin Gaye's question was, what's going on? 
That's an absolutely crucial question, which every movement has to ask and answer. What's going on? And Lenin's question was, what's to be done? And that, they're not, it's not just a Lenin question, that's a question for every movement. You know, what's going on and what is to be done? And those arguments are not just their theoretical arguments or conceptual arguments, but of course they're practical arguments as well. And they've got several aspects. One of them is in the question, what is, what's going on? How is the world organised? What, what, what is happening? Um, why, why is it happening like it is? And is it changeable? That's a very important part of the question. What's going on and is it changeable? Second question, sometimes people get very cross about people using the language of identity. They say, well, identity politics, you know, it's a curse of so It's anti-socialist and so on. But every movement is about identity. Because it poses questions about identity. Who are we? Who are they? That's, those are our questions about identity. What are they like? What are we like? What can we be? The questions are not just who are we, but what can we be? What could we be? How changeable can we be? How changeable are they, the, our opponents? And the last question, which is a practical question, which is what can we do? Which is more than what can we do, it's also what can we become? How can we change? Um, how can we organise? Who should we try and reach? Um, all those are matters for debate inside movements. And, we, and no doubt, you know, I, mean, I listen to the conversations sometimes between Eva and Judy, um, or I hear about them, about the uh, Barton Moss. And all those questions come up, you know, about uh, what to do, who are we, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, fourth thing, and these are, I could be briefer on the last two. The first, the first, the fourth thing is, I say movements are fields of argument, but the, argu the fields of argument are not only arguments in which the people on our side can participate, so can our, so can our opponents. The other night, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we have a view about uh, the struggle about benefits, for example, but so do the employers, so do the Daily Mail and the Daily Express, and so does... Uh, who, the people who produce Benefit Street on TV and so on, they participate, the ruling class participates in all sorts of ways in arguments inside our movements. They demand that we have responsible statesmen like trade union leaders who will cooperate with the employers and not be naughty boys or girls. Um, so they don't like Bob Crow and they really highly approve of, uh, what's his name, uh, Dave Prentice of Unison to the extent they made him a governor of the Bank of England. Uh, I didn't know if you knew that, but uh, Dave Prentice is not only the leader of Unison, but also one of the governors of the Bank of England. Um, so the class struggle runs not simply between movements and their opponents, but actually runs inside movements. There's, there's a contest going on all the time for the ideas in people's heads inside movements, and not simply involving the people inside the movements debating, but also their opponents also participating in the debates. And the last thing to say about movements, which is really important, we remember, is that up to now we've assumed that movements are always progressive. But remember that the Ku Klux Klan was a movement. Remember that the Nazi Party adopted many of the features of movements. You know, it adopted red flags and May Day parades and all sorts of other things that it borrowed from the socialist movement. So it doesn't follow that or Golden Dawn or the Society for the protection of the unborn child, and so on and so on. There also, there also are campaigns and movements and so on, which are not in any sense progressive. So we should be very careful, be very careful not to assume that we're just in favour of movements in general. You always have to make judgments about movements and so on. So it's not a question of celebrating the nature of movements and saying, oh, great, movements are, um, you know, there's a tendency... Um, to, to treat movements as if somehow they're an alternative to parties and the rest of it, which is what some anarchist thinkers tend to do. What we have to remember is that movements are, as networks are inherently divided, inherently argumentative, um, full of all sorts of opposing currents. So when we talk about movements, we're talking about things we can intervene in, participate in, or oppose, in the case of the Nazis or whatever, but nonetheless you have to think about them as a place where you there's an argument to be conducted always. So I'm not setting up 
um, any kind of opposition between, say, the organised labour movement and social movements. Sometimes, uh, I remember Chris Harmon once set that up as an opposition inside an art- in an article in the IS Journal. And I was meant to write a reply, I was absolutely disappointed. When he died, I was really sad that I'd never got round to writing a reply to him on that point, because I'd been very interested to see what he had to say. The organised labour movement is, of course, an absolutely vital part of movements to challenge capitalism, but it isn't all there is to movements to challenge capitalism. It's part of what Marx once called in a quotation, which I haven't put in this sheet I've given you, um, the social movement in general, which is another way of saying the class struggle as a whole. Um, So, implications, finally, to shut up. Um, Movements, I I would suggest that movements, in all their messy reality and the difficulty of definition, and so on and so on and so on, that they are the things that really change the world. It's not parties that change the world, it's movements that change the world. And it's not classes that change the world, it's movements that change the world. They are the political form <coughs> in which people organise themselves to change the world. And the, they have expressions, organisational expressions. A Soviet is a movement institution. It is not a party institution. A trade union is a movement institution. It is not a party institution, and so on. And they are the kinds of organisations which, which Marxists see as capable of founding a new society. And that means that you know, next week we're supposed to be talking about party and class. Well, I think we could think whether we shouldn't really be talking about party and movement. Um, And on that, I will shut up.